Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome a few special guests as we start this afternoon's program, beginning with Dr. Jim Cavanaugh, the chairman of the board of the Richard Nixon Foundation, and his fellow board members, Christopher Nixon Cox, Gavin Herbert, Sandy Quinn, and Charlie Zhang. Thank you all for being here. We're gathered at the Nixon Library this afternoon to discuss the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine. The recent hostilities began on February 24th and sadly took an even more brutal shift this morning with the new Russian offenses in the Donbass. Our panelists today will tell what they know of the war to date, from military strategy to amazing stories of Ukrainian resolve, as well as the terrible toll of casualty, destruction, and human suffering. And our panel will evaluate the response of the Western world and discuss a path forward that is in America's national interest. Our panelists today are Ambassador Robert C. O'Brien, America's 28th National Security Advisor, who before that served as Special Envoy for Hostage Affairs and as a U.S. Representative to the U.N. General Assembly. Ambassador O'Brien is also co-chair of the Nixon Seminar, the Nixon Foundation's ongoing monthly educational foreign policy series. Sean Penn is an Academy Award-winning film performer who recently returned from Ukraine and who has been filming a documentary about the Russian invasion. Mr. Penn visited the front lines and met with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky before evacuating to the Polish border. Mr. Penn is also known for his humanitarian efforts as the founder of CORE, the Community Organized Relief Effort, which has provided resources to the most vulnerable communities for COVID testing and vaccinations. CORE's latest efforts include setting up operations in Poland to support Ukrainian refugees. And finally, our friend Brett Bayer, the Fox News chief political anchor and host of Special Report with Brett Bayer, which is the top rated cable news program in its time slot. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our distinguished panel. Thank you. Brett. Thank you. Thank you. Are you on the right or the left? I think I'm. <laughs> <laughs> Had to open with a joke. Wow, it is great to be here, to be back here in the East Room. It's always wonderful to be back at the Nixon Presidential Library, and I'm really uh, fortunate to be kind of a moderator uh, to let you all hear these amazing stories uh, about what's happening on the ground in Ukraine, uh, about what's happening around the world, and even what's happening with a certain project uh, that Sean's working on a little bit later. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being here. We kind of put this together in a thought that uh, we could illuminate uh, some of what's happening uh, inside Ukraine. You all see it on your television screens every day, uh, but you don't really see it like this. And Sean's been doing some amazing stuff on the ground with his documentary that'll be coming out soon. But at first, I want to ask you both, you know, national security advisor, actor, activist, humanitarian, how, what's the connection between the two of you? So uh, a lot of you know, before I became the national security advisor, I served as the special presidential envoy for hostage affairs. And one of the things that President Trump was known for was, was bringing Americans who were held hostage or wrongfully detained in, in terrible countries and places all over the world, bringing them back. And one of the people that I was focused on was a young American journalist named Austin Tice, a great young American, Georgetown law student, former Marine, and he'd gone to be a war correspondent in Syria and had been taken hostage back in 2012. And I had to fight my way through the bureaucracy uh, in Washington to get permission to go to, to Syria. Uh, to try and meet Bashir al-Assad, to, to, to plead and, and negotiate to try and get uh, Austin home. And uh, at one point, I finally got the approval on the U.S. side, and I went to the Middle East, and we sent the letter uh, through channels, and, and the Syrians wouldn't see me. And then I got a call from Sean, and uh, Sean had filmed a documentary in Syria. He'd heard about Austin's case, and he said, hey, uh, raised his hand and said, let me go to Syria and see what I can do to try and get Austin home. And and my approach on, on hostage cases was all of the above. And, uh, and I'd been a fan of, uh, of Sean's, of course, as, a, as an actor. And uh, 
we, we met and, and he was uh, willing to, at personal risk to, uh, to go into Ukraine or go into Syria at that time and, and try and find Austin. And he didn't end up going, but it was a, I thought it was a really impressive uh, a gesture on his part as a, as a humanitarian and, uh, and we gave it a shot. That's where it started. Yeah, I mean, there has been uh, a, many, a, a few other incidents of this where my first stop would be to, to talk to somebody at the State Department and make sure I wasn't uh, trampling on a, an existing um, strategy when it came to hostage release. And there would have been one in particular in Bolivia uh, where the State Department felt that, that every time they exerted any pressure on the Bolivian government, uh, the Bolivians responded by uh, being an empowered David to our Goliath and that it wasn't going to be uh, valuable to continue that way. So then they said, go ahead and try. And we were able to get that um, American brought back. So you get kind of excited when, when you can play any small role in something like that. And so it became uh, something that I was looking to do. And then in the case of, of Austin Tice, uh, the people I talked to said, uh, you're going to have to talk to our boss. Would you talk to our boss? And that's when uh, the boss and I got together and, <laughs> and, uh, and we became friends and, uh, you know, in that effort. Your organization, CORE, Community Organized Release, Relief Effort, does stuff here in the U.S., but obviously around the world. How did that all come to be? Total accident. I had a son that had had a, a traumatic brain injury and had to have emergency brain surgery. He's completely uh, recovered today. Um, and I had been single parenting him for a period of time. And then this awful thing happened. And it, right after, it was shortly after he had made a decision to spend some time with his mother. And so I was going to be, I had planned out two years to be getting him through high school and now I was suddenly on my own, and uh, four days after that, the earthquake in Haiti happened. What's significant about the, the brain trauma was that I had seen the relief he got from pain post-op from morphine in the hospital. And then when, the, when I turned on the news the day of the earthquake in Haiti, the first reports were about amputations on children without any intravenous pain medication, that they had none available. So uh, because I had an existing relationship with uh, Hugo Chavez, uh, and because uh, actors in Hollywood know where to find narcotics, but not bulk narcotics, <laughs> um, I, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to call anybody in the United States with all the, the regulations and such. And I said, you know, the, Paul Farmer tells me, may he rest in peace, an incredible man, Paul Farmer. Uh, tells me they need 350,000 vials of morphine. And if you'll get it down to your embassy, I'll get some friends with some pickup trucks and we'll deliver it to the trauma centers and so on. And that, and that happened. And he sent it. I remember going to the uh, lieutenant colonel of the 82nd Airborne with whom we were embedded at that time in Port-au-Prince. And I said, is it going to be a problem for you if, uh, if I've got a bunch of boxes of morphine in my tent labeled <laughs> a gift from the people of Venezuela? And uh, he said, we'll make our apologies later. And that's what started CORE. We started doing that. Uh, your organization says it saves lives, strengthens communities affected by or vulnerable to crisis. Obviously, Ukraine is in that position. Uh, Robert, I want to talk to you about your past connection with Ukraine. And obviously, as national security advisor and before that, and how you looked at that country before this latest crisis started. Yeah, so my first uh, experience, Brett, with Ukraine was uh, going in 2014 as an election observer for the International Republican Institute, the IRI. And, and recall, this is right after the maiden protests when the Ukrainians finally threw off the yoke of the, the Russian oligarchs and the, and the Russian influenced government. And, and for the first time, we're gonna have democratic elections for parliament. And I went with a group of, of former U.S. officials. Uh, there were Democrats, Republicans, uh, uh, former members of Congress, and, and diplomats. And we went to observe to make sure that the elections were free and fair. And, and I remember one incident. Uh, we were, I was there checking the ballot boxes, making sure the seals were tight on them, that sort of thing. And there was a lady who came to vote. And she had her daughter with her. And her daughter had a Ukrainian flag. And I said, oh, you know, did you not have child care today? Or, or why did you bring your daughter? And she said, no, no. 
uh, I wanted to bring her so she could see that you can vote for your own leaders and, and to, for her to see what a democracy looks like because I've lived my whole life either under Soviet rule or under corrupt rule and this is the first time we got a chance to have a democracy. And I, I really developed a love for the Ukrainian people. They're, uh, they're, they're wonderful folks and, uh, and now we're seeing their spirit and their, their, their boldness and their daring as they, as they fight a much bigger neighbor uh, for their own freedom and for their own sovereignty. But as National Security Advisor, you also dealt with that region and dealt with Putin. I mean, you sat just down the table for him uh, in, the, in the Libya talks yeah. uh, in Berlin with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Uh, you know, looking at what Putin is doing now, you know, your assessment of him and his mental state and where you saw him and where he is now. Yeah, so, so he's a very cordial guy. He's a soft-spoken guy. Uh, but he believes the biggest geopolitical disaster of his lifetime was the collapse of the Soviet Union. And Russia, and when he thinks that, <coughs> excuse me, the Soviet Union, he's thinking of uh, kind of an imperial Russia where Russia controlled all the stands, where they controlled Georgia, where they controlled Ukraine, where they controlled the Baltics. And his goal, uh, just like dictators we've seen in the past, you know, we, we thought we'd move past the 1930s and 1940s, but just like dictators of old, he wants to rebuild the Russian Empire. He wants to be a new czar. And he would like to take back Ukraine. He's got troops in Georgia, where I've been, and, uh, uh, and, and has, has taken you know, almost half of Georgia. He's taken parts of Moldova. Uh, in 2014, he invaded and occupied Crimea. And at the time, I said, this is something we haven't seen since the, the Anschluss with Germany and Austria, and then the, the Munich Accords when, when Germany was given, uh, at the time Nazi Germany was given, Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. And the idea was if you just give, if you appease these dictators a little bit, if you just give them a little bit of land, uh, uh, give them a little bit of what they want, that'll sate them, and then they'll stop with, with their aggression. And, and we know that, that that doesn't work. It actually increases their appetite. And that's what happened with Putin, and it's something you know, we warned about and we're very concerned about. And it's one of the reasons why we got the Javelin anti-tank missiles uh, to uh, Ukraine during the Trump administration. We, we worked very hard to get those. And there, there were a lot of folks in, in the Pentagon and the State Department and otherwise that said, we, we can't give the Ukrainians missiles to defend themselves because that will provoke Putin. That'll encourage him to invade. And, and, and I felt, and the President felt, it was just the opposite, that if we got the missiles to defend themselves, that could deter Vladimir Putin. And in fact, it was those Javelin missiles in the early days of the, uh, the crisis when Sean was in the ground in, in Ukraine. It was those Javelin anti-tank missiles made here in America and, and given to Ukraine by you, the American taxpayers, that allowed the Ukrainians to blunt the three-pronged uh, three axis uh, uh, armored attack of the Russians and, and, and blunt that attack and, and buy themselves some time to, uh, to fight for their independence and freedom. I mean, it's amazing to see the Ukrainians and the resilience and their fight I think it surprised the world. It may have even surprised them. Uh, but let's talk about your effort the first time you go in and what the purpose was, and tell me about that decision. So there, not long ago, we'll remember a time where most Americans knew Ukraine from a comic actor who had become a president and a single phone call with our president, and then the echoes around the Bidens and, and all of the politicking that went around that. And we had thought, what an interesting story his would be. And so about at that time, we started, uh, we had a, a, a contact that could get us in touch with President Zelensky. We made our case that we thought we could tell a, a story that was you know, anchored in him, but would illuminate his country uh, to America and others in ways that it hadn't previously been. And so we began a, a Zoom conversations, and then we were we recorded, kind of effectively shut down for during COVID, where we weren't able, to, one wasn't able to travel to the other, and so on. So that's what would put it off, and then we picked it back up, and we uh, went initially in November, uh, tra traveled through the country, uh, went to Mariupol, uh, because we were also going to involve what was an existing border conflict. Uh, and, and an occupation uh, in Crimea. And, and, um, and then, but at that time, that big uh, Wagner scandal was going on related to the aircraft that had been down. And so the, the president was not able to, to see us. Uh, so we covered musicians and cultural things and so on in Kiev. And then came back to the States and were looking for the right time to come back here. And of course, by that time, 
tensions, well, the tensions had begun to be palpable. The build up in was November, happening. we had known this was starting to be an issue. Uh, and then we, somebody, the, you know, as the tensions that we've all been aware of were building to the point that they're at today, I started getting phone calls from my partners in crime saying, you know, we got to get back now because it's going to be there. You know, the intelligence agencies we hear on the, the news are saying it's going to happen tomorrow. It's going to happen on the 16th. It's going to happen. And we got to be there when the thing, and I had, I guess I felt that I had enough, or maybe I lucked out this time, experience with feeling like, you, you know, it's going to happen tomorrow, you got to get on the plane and go, and then being somewhere for 10 days, nothing happens. You get on the plane, and you, when you land, you find out it happened when you were on the plane. <laughs> so I decided to stay to my schedule, my plans with my kids, this, that, and, and this is the day we'll go. It'll be fine. Whatever's happening, we'll cover. We're not here to create or invent a war for the fireworks of this documentary. So. Uh, the timing was such that we went we were there about five, six days. How do you get in? Is it safe? Is it nothing's happening? It's um, it's very tense. Uh, Robert Robert will confirm to you that uh, the our government is extremely good at caution. <laughs> you know when when many people on the uh, fringe, fringe right to separate them from people in this room. On uh, the fringe right, might wanna, wanted to have taken off my head and I was called an enemy of the state. Anytime, anything I had done publicly, uh, you know, created any level of threat, I always had the FBI knocking on my door and letting me know. It's, all, it's a very, there's a lot of re great responsibility in the system and it functions very well for American citizens. At the same time, this level of caution said at that time when we went back, don't go. This is because the, the American diplomats had been pulled out of, and, and other foreign service officers pulled out of Kiev. Don't go. There's nobody there. There'll be no ca cavalry, and so on. And, um, and I was speaking to Robert the whole time. He, he knows the region much better than I do. And I made it, we, we made it a kind of calculated bet that, we, that it would be fine, whatever happened. And sure enough, we there about five, six days. The very first time that I met President Zelensky, that we met with President Zelensky, was the long agreed to moment for him to go eyeball to eyeball with us and decide if he was going to open his doors to us as a documentary crew. So we said, we will come without a camera the first time. You size this up and tell us if this is finalized and we're going to do it. So we had that meeting, and here he was. All of the elements were in place for the potential invasion by the Russians. He certainly was prepared for that, but I don't think anybody wanted to give up a level of denial that it would happen, because that would be giving up hope that it wouldn't happen. So we met with him, a man in a suit, and um, the next morning, the Russians invaded. We went back, we were with President Zelensky, at, at, waited for him at, at a meeting point, and the next time I saw him, he was in camos, and the world had changed. At that time, you know the buildup's happening, you know the danger, you're talking to people, and you're having com communications. Yeah, so I, uh, the, the problem with Sean is when you tell Sean not to go, you know he's gonna go. Uh, so <laughs> that was the... Uh, that was a problem I was having. I was uh, talking to our colleagues in, uh, uh, in, in Washington, and, and they said, look, tell your friend Penn not to go. So I told Sean to go and not to go, and so he called me the next day and said, I'm going. And uh, I said, okay, we'll stay in close touch. And uh, fortunately, the, the, the guy who replaced me, Ambassador Roger Carson, is a, ter a terrific uh, special presidential envoy for hostage affairs. And so I know it would be you know, Roger's job to get uh, Sean out if the Russians got a hold of him. But uh, I counseled him not to go. He went anyway, but showed it again demonstrated his personal bravery and I think his commitment to the people of Ukraine. And, uh, and that he had, uh, he was able, they're, they're kind of at the, the, the foundation of the legend. And this is something Brett, you and I, and, and Sean talked about earlier. What we're watching with Pre President Zelensky is, is something very unique. It, we're watching a legend born. And we don't know how it's all gonna play out, but we're watching it in real time with social media, with, with the documentaries, with your interviews, with uh, President Zelensky. Uh, and, and we're watching someone who was urged, just like I urged Sean not to go to Ukraine, 
Uh, the United States had offered President Zelensky safe passage out of Kiev. They had offered to send a helicopter to Kiev to, to pick him up and, and take him to Poland or to, to the UK, to London, and he could have a government in exile, uh, you know, very akin to what happened in World War II. And President Zelensky said, no, I'm, I'm staying and my family's staying. So we're watching a, a, a legend being created in front of our own eyes. And, uh, and he's communicated very effectively with the world. And he's really laid out what this is. This is, a, this is good versus evil. This is people who want the freedom in their own country, that don't want to be bullied, that don't want to be taken over, that don't want to have a puppet government installed by uh, an authoritarian neighbor. And, and they're willing to fight for their freedom. And, uh, and, and President Zelensky is willing to go out to the front lines with his people. I mean, this is not a guy who's leading from behind. This is a guy who's at the front. Uh, now, I made the mistake early on of saying this is kind of like Davy Crockett at the Alamo or, or uh, Hector at Troy. And then I realized, you know, it didn't really work out very well for Hector or for Davy Crockett. And so analogy think, doesn't uh, be. So I had to come up with a better analogy. And then I, I, so I, I, I've been going with the, uh, Charles de Gaulle now, uh, being the, the, the embodiment of, of France, of free France during, during the war. But, but, you know, Zelensky's there and he's fighting and he's, uh, he's really inspiring people, I think, around the world. And, and I think it's one of the reasons why you're getting, you know, I, I'm, Sean and my politics couldn't be more different. And, uh, but, but we're good friends, and that's, that's the great thing about America and, and how it used to be. You know, we all grew up with, you had uncles and aunts and friends and neighbors who were Democrats or Republicans, but we're all Americans, and, and we we're all trying to do the right thing for our country and for freedom. And, and, and that's the kind of friendship that, that Sean and I have, even though our, our politics probably don't align. But what's interesting in this crisis, Brett, and I think you're seeing it as well, I spend a lot of time you know, out on the, the, the stump, so to speak, for, for congressional candidates, for Republicans to... And we want to take back the House in the fall with her and have Kevin McCarthy, a fellow Californian, be the new leader of the House. That's something Sean doesn't want to happen. But, uh, but, but when I go out at, at these events, everybody is inspired and fighting for and pulling for the Ukrainians. I mean, and we're not talking about sending U.S. troops to Ukraine, but they want us to supply them with the tools. They want us to be the arsenal of democracy again and to help the Ukrainian people. And I think Sean's seen it on the progressive side, on the, on the, on the Democrat side. This is something that's uniting the American people because they're watching folks just like us uh, fighting for their lives, fighting for their kids, fighting for their homes, fighting for their freedom uh, against some really bad actors uh, who, who want nothing more than to, because they've got more strength and because they've got a bigger country and, and more might, uh, or at least it looked that way on paper until the Ukrainians punched them back in the nose, uh, we're just going to come invade their country and take it over because they could. And, and that's not how we do things in the world anymore. And, and the Ukrainians are, are, I think, you know, a real example to all of us. Well, I want to get back to that unity and that mission, uh, but I want to take you back to that room meeting with Zelensky and those early days where you're finally getting the decision whether you have to stay or go because it's starting to heat up, right? I'd prefer we circle back to that and, and just continue on the unity thing. Okay, all right, moment. we'll come. But we'll... Because uh, exactly as Robert was saying, this that we find everywhere, and I'm, I would wager in this room, this an incredible amount of unity on the issue of Ukraine. But I believe that what we owe Ukraine is 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 a unity that, that goes beyond that, and which and, and I think that in many cases it's the more sophisticated people who invest more in the cynical notion that there is nothing to be, be gained by trying to reach across the aisle. I have engaged in that feeling. I think we're at the breaking point of that. And if there's anything that we can do that is supportive and not a betrayal of Ukraine, that is um, taking the opportunity of their inspiration, it's to stop being cynical about the possibility that we can, can understand each other's ideas. In so many cases, it's the profiling of the ideas that makes it a semantic schism. And that there are so many, uh, you know, as they say, things that we can, we can do uh, uh, as a country together. We become so divided, and going to Ukraine, more than anything else, was the impact of what we'd been missing. People who have every bit the diversity and polarization almost of ideology, who are able to work together and and to fight together and to, and to have a common courage. And, and it's something to realize what we've been missing in our everyday feeling about life that they have while under this threat. There are elements of both parties, Democrats and Republicans, who say, listen, why is this in our national interest? Why 
should we push this envelope? Why should we possibly face World War III with a nuclear-armed Russia? There are elements of both sides, progressives and conservatives, who do say that today. And what do you say to them? Well, a lot of this is, you know, what if Ukraine loses? And look at how they have lost, and the children killed, and the women raped and mutilated, and, and, and all the brave soldiers, men, women, and children, who are fighting for the same dream that we share. And I think the better question is, what if Russia wins? And so this avoidance of nuclear war, if we maintain it for that reason, God knows, there could be nothing more horrifying. And yet, those weapons exist. They're in the Russians' hands. They're in our hands. They're in Chinese hands. They're in Pakistani hands. They're in many hands. And we have two problems. One is that if we want to get them out of anybody's hands, they're going to look at the Budapest Memorandum, and they're going to say, well, we gave, the Ukrainians gave up their nuclear weapons on the agreement that the Russians would never invade them. Presidents Clinton and Yeltsin were standing there as it was so signed. And what happened? The Russians are invading and nobody's helping. Now, I don't mean nobody's helping, like a lot of our tax dollars aren't going into javelins and, and, and stingers and, 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 and other aspects of this. But without United States direct presence, with these uh, aviation assets that we, have all, we all recognize the value of, the Ukrainians win this war, but for the possibility, yes, of nuclear war. That's putting nuclear war off to another day, if that's going to happen. That's putting it off to another battle. That's putting it off to my kids. And so I think that we have to operate on enforcing the, believing as much as we can that within the Russian leadership, there is more than one finger that's got to push a button and that there is some, some recognition of what that means. And if, it, if, we, if we stop it today, we won't stop it tomorrow. And we've got to get in there and do the right thing and not be a nation that, that succumbs to intimidation and fear. Brother? Yeah. Look, Sean makes some great points there. What I would say is that, look, we have one of the, the great things that happened in all of our lifetimes was the end of the Cold War and the freeing of states in Eastern Europe, uh, Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovak, uh, the Slovak Republic, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, uh, the Baltic states, the captive nations that we all learned about in school growing up. Uh, if Putin is successful in Ukraine, he's gonna go after the Baltics next. He's already said, he's already fingered Sweden and Finland which is why the two, those two nations are probably gonna join NATO, and that'll be one of, the great, one of the good outcomes of this crisis, is that we're gonna strengthen NATO. Putin was attempting to, to uh, weaken NATO, drive a wedge into NATO through the invasion of Ukraine, hoping that the Germans and, and the Italians, those that were de dependent on his oil and gas, uh, would, would uh, cave. And, and instead, he's gonna end up with a NATO that not only is unified, but includes Sweden and Finland which are both very capable countries, have very capable militaries, are on the Russian border, they play in the Arctic. Uh, so, so, you know, it, it's, I, I think that's one of the, the positive outcomes, but all of those nations would be threatened. But Brett, keep in mind, the number one person who's watching this war, it's, he's sitting in Beijing. His name is Xi Jinping, the chairman of the Communist Party of China, the general secretary, because he wants Taiwan. And if we lose Taiwan, Taiwan is the geopolitical cork in the champagne bottle in the, in the Pacific. If that cork comes out, the PLA Navy, the PLA Army runs rampant across the Pacific, just like we saw in World War II. That's the, that's the, the highway for them to threaten Hawaii, the Aleutian Islands, Guam, all of our allies to, to split the Pacific, to split, split South Korea and Japan, our treaty allies, from Australia and New Zealand and, and Thailand and the Philippines, our treaty allies in the South. And Xi Jinping, wants Taiwan desperately for his own glory and for the, for the, the geopolitical advantage that it serves for the people, for, for the Chinese Communist Party. And he's watching Ukraine. And if he sees the Russians succeed in Ukraine, he's gonna go after Taiwan and he's gonna go after Taiwan quickly. Now the, the good news that's coming out is he's watching the West coalesce and, and, and become united in support of the Ukrainian people. 
He's watching military equipment get funneled into Ukraine. Most importantly, he's watching the Ukrainian people fight like heck to keep their freedom. And he's got to be thinking, is this what the Taiwanese people are going to do if I try and invade? And so we, th th this, this crisis has implications far beyond it, important implications in Europe and Eastern Europe. But, but f it goes far beyond Europe, and it goes into the Indo-Pacific, where, where we have a tremendous national interest. And so, so if we can unite and unite the West, if we can cut Putin off and his economy off, so not these half-measure sanctions that we've got in place now, but fully decouple the Russian economy from the free world, uh, that's something China can't afford. China doesn't want to be, it's not, it doesn't have a home market that's big enough to, to accept all the, the manufacturing it does. If China can't export to the U.S., Australia, Japan, Europe, India, China's in real trouble. So if, if, if Xi Jinping sees the, the free world unite against the Russians, put in tough economic sanctions, support the Ukrainian people with the materials and, and weapons that they need to defend themselves, that's going to be a massive deterrent to him invading Taiwan which would be a real political disaster for the United States of America. So, so it's, it's not just what's happening in Europe. You know, others are watching, and, and you know, the, the Iranians are keeping their eyes on this as well. So there, there, there are, there are second-level consequences to, the, to how we respond to this invasion, and they're critical to our country. I'll tell the room here, we were hoping to get uh, President Zelensky on the Skype uh, to, to come in. He's still meeting with some dignitaries, and he may pop in, so we'll interrupt the discussion, obviously, if he pops up uh, and has a message for you all. But he, because of the respect of both of these men and just interacting with Sean, uh, he wanted to get uh, uh, to be a part of this. So we're still efforting that. Bear with me. I'm going back to that room. Mm -hmm. And you're making the decision whether you're going or not going. And it's tense. You've met with Zelensky. He's obviously impressed you. You've impressed him. It's moving forward. But you have to make a call. You, you mean in terms of, of leaving? Oh, uh, this is a, uh, yeah. So after when the, once the invasion had started, what happened? Uh, we, um, my my colleagues and I, uh, Aaron Kaufman, my co-director, is here right now. Uh, we where we I, I refer to it as where we met with him. I think it's probably a public secret at this stage, but I'm going to continue to refer to it that way. Where we met with him um, was. Uh, in such a place where we would not know when day had turned into night. We would not know if um, certain other organic sounds might instead be um, the vibrations of rockets uh, above. And so we had gone in in the daylight, and when we came out, we came out to uh, a city under complete curfew, uh, blackout. Uh, the um, Recommendation was that we not take our car back to where we where we were staying. It was, I don't know, it was about a two mile walk, and and so it was it was a great way to process the conversation and the day. Um, the city was under air raid, and some you know we knew knew that the rockets had hit for sure at the airport where they then came in. Um, briefly, the Russians had taken just over. outside Kiev, about just twenty outside. miles back. Yeah. And so we were trying to sort all of, you know, what we had just, the man we'd just met, what it meant, what the world meant now in this night. And we took this long walk back to the hotel, quietly, slowly. We got back to the hotel. The hotel was in blackout. Everybody was in a, a makeshift bomb shelter in the parking garage. Went down there. It wasn't as, um, you know, as my, you know, it wasn't as easy to get a vodka tonic and hang out and meet, it, meet journalists and talk about what was happening in a normal way. People are on cots and the, and so we sat together and and to sort of tried to measure what our plan of action was. It had never been our intention to do, you know, a, as I said, to do a um, a war documentary per se. We knew that archivally there would be. Is, is always going to be today so much more being collected by people this way that you're going to archive. And I had, you know, this measured sense of what my calendar was. And, and uh, there was a question of whether, you know, it was not so much one wouldn't have gotten ahead of themselves to the point of uh, Russian uh, occupation and what that could mean personally or to other people around you. 
but the encirclement of the city seemed inevitable within hours. That was what the information on the ground was. And so I was calling Robert, who back here in the States, and saying, what do you think? What do All you right, think? We've, got, we've got a clip from that moment. Uh, you're <laughs> on the phone or just off the phone. Yeah, this is the day, the day after I'm talking about it. Okay, yeah. take a listen. I just heard from Robin O'Brien, he said, get the f*** out. <laughs> so, you talked to him at that point. The bleep, was, <laughs> the bleep was us, by the way. The bleep is not in the, uh, the documentary. You talked to him, and you're hearing from people saying, yeah, so, so for all my friends in Utah, you know, I, I'm, 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 not, I'm not sure Sean <laughs> properly translated that, but... Uh, Lost in translation. Uh, yeah, it, it was the Ukrainian version. It was my version. interpretation yeah, of yeah, what yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. No, so look, we knew Sean was on the ground, and, and uh, there, were, there were just so, some wonderful people in our, in our State Department, in the Diplomatic Security Division, and, and the hostage office, and that sort of thing, who are... This is nonpartisan work, and... Uh, and, and I stay in touch with them, and, and so I kind of let them know what was happening, and, and they said, look, he's got to get out, he's got to get out now, because at the time, the, the Russian plan was a decapitation uh, strike. They were trying to get paratroopers through this local airport uh, and, that was about 20 miles outside or 20 kilometers outside of, of Kiev, and then race those paratroopers in, surround the presidential palace, uh, surround the, uh, uh, the key ministry buildings, and, and, and take out the government and put in a puppet very quickly. And, and at least early on, the, the plan was going uh, uh, according to, uh, uh, as the Russians had hoped it would. And we know Sean was, was in the center of the city, somewhere close to President Zelensky. And uh, everyone said, tell him to get out. And, and I had told Sean before, uh, that my advice to him was keep a full tank of gas. And you've been in war combat zones or imported from there. there. There's nothing like having a full tank of gas, water, and a, and a wad of cash. And uh, I said, keep cash, gas, and water. And, and I called him and I said, now's the time. You've got, you've got to exfil yourself right now while you can still drive uh, over the border and get into Poland and um, you know, drive up to Lviv. And then Lviv is about 60 miles from, uh, or 60 kilometers from the Polish border. And I said, you know, you've got to go and you've got to go now. And the timing And, and that, 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 that's, that's what uh, Oh, the time, the, the, in fact, the, 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 the people that we, because you're in real time conversations with <laughs> others, some of whom for varying reasons also had to make sure they didn't get stuck for six weeks, hunkered down, um, had obligations elsewhere or where they thought they could be more value added to the effort elsewhere. Um, and so your information sharing with, with each other and, and we had gotten what we thought was very good information, which again, as, as I said before, you would think about worst case scenarios. You think, well, if there's encirclement, we're certainly gonna be stuck here for this much time. So it could be somebody who uh, you know, is, 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 is in leadership and, is, and, and needs to be at a front line with, with, um, with the battle command and needs to get out of the encircled area. It could be someone like me who's saying, okay, I, I wanna go back, I wanna process this footage, I wanna be able to get some real time, um, you know, any way I can help get light on the thing. It could be for any reason. And I think I had the, probably through Robert the most credible um, information at the, at the time, and what we did is that next day after when, when that clip, uh, Aaron and I are talking, and we had a security consultant there, uh, and say, you know, we, we our information is this, and and he thinks that the best time to leave is ten minutes ago, and <laughs> so we said, let okay, uh, you, you know, is there a is there a weapon? Where is the weapon? And the security consultant said, there's no weapon, and I thought. I, w I was only hoping that he had a weapon hidden all this time. So we said, okay, I think we're gonna go. Had we left 45 minutes, an hour later, the very same, the fr people that we had told, well, they went believing in what we were saying to pack their things and get arranged their car. They left one hour after us and the, it, the same, in the same, what it took us from Kiev towards Lviv, um, one hour in the first part of the drive to get to, 
An hour later, it took 11 hours for, for, for the others to get to. And what's normally a seven hour drive, city to city, was for us a 25 hour drive because you, we, we came towards one of the, the Russians were engaged on the main road, so we knew we had to go around that. And then uh, the bridge we were gonna go over got blown out, so then we had to go around. And now you don't know which gas station you're plotting to get to, and you know, as he says, uh, fuel is very important. <laughs> and so it became, you know, its own odyssey. Um, but again, going back, just this incredible experience of what these people represent of spirit and, and unification. Now, I went back to Ukraine a couple of weeks ago uh, because now CORE is operating both inside, outside of Ukraine and Romania, Poland, and Ukraine. And we took the documentary team and we hope that all of it will add up to uh, something of value in telling the story. You know, in Zelensky, you both talk about him as this figure who stepped up to the day. Um, a few weeks ago, I interviewed President Zelensky, and one of the questions I asked him was, you know, you've done really well engaging the world to try to get help, talking to parliaments, talking to people around the world. Is he fearful about the world forgetting about this moment in Ukraine? Take a listen to this. World attention has been key to Ukraine's resistance strategy. What happens when interest wanes? Are you worried that the West has a short attention span? That is a very big problem. And it, it's, it's not about interest to, to, for, the, for the Ukraine, for our soldiers, for, for peace, for democracy. I don't believe that we'll lose. But always but, you know, if we will we'll not be so strong and Russia would, would go through the Ukraine to another country. You will see how all other dictators or you know, all other countries, big countries in the world, will change uh, their principles and will do the same. That will not be the last war in the world. It will be the first, the first of, of those future biggest wars in the world. You said that in English, uh, saying that if you don't stop them now, they're going to continue. Uh, just got word, he is still meeting with those dignitaries and sends his regrets, but this is a leader who is pretty remarkable, if you think about it, in this moment. Absolutely, I, you know, and, the, and in, in, in responding to that and circling back to the, an earlier thought and what Robert was saying, you know, the. It, it, the, the, if only hindsight being a lesson for us now, certainly there is a great, great case to be made that had we exercised absolute sanctions early, we'd have saved a lot of lives. We're still not exercising them on, in the energy sector in ways that we could. The initial and, and logical thought was that if, he, if Putin invaded, it would be to take advantage of the winter months and how people's dependence on that energy for, for heat would, would, would break the back of the Ukrainians and others. Well, now we're in the warmer days and this is the moment to grab, to, 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 to ask of our allies and to offer in any ways necessary an attrition on energy so that we can, you know, maybe we ride a bike and their kids get to live for these next months. But I think a real shutdown, Germany's principle in this, it was one of the first things I talked to Robert about when I was just asking or and, you know, inquiring out of his knowledge about, about it uh, before I went. And, and I think it's the case today. And what's happened is that Putin is now in a, in a position of being humiliated. And we could have saved him that. But the sanctions, I, I believe, would have had enormous impact and probably stop this from happening. There's a lot of, you know, back and forth about uh, domestic oil production here and what we could be doing differently. And obviously that goes down a political road in, in how the parties talk about it. But what people really don't understand is this sanctions regime and how this is not affecting Russia, how there's still the gas problem, the oil companies making more money now, price of gas is up, oil's up, than they did at the beginning of the war. 
why aren't these sanctions biting and stopping Putin? So we put sanctions on Russia on what's called the SWIFT system, which is the way that banks communicate with each other, and we kick the Russian banks off the SWIFT system. We also put sanctions on the Russian Central Bank, the Russian Federation Central Bank, which would prohibit them from operating in dollars, and, and oil and gas sales are, are almost all in dollars. Now, what we did with those sanctions, we exempted oil and gas sales. And so when you think about sanctioning the Russian economy, when's the last time anyone here, raise your hand, went on Amazon and said, I've got to get that latest thing from Russia, okay? <laughs> Never. It didn't happen because those only, dolls that yeah, come out of yeah, Israel. Yeah, there you go. No? Well, the Gorbachev dolls. But uh, the uh, the the only thing the Russians sell is oil and gas, some agricultural products, and some mineral, and some extraction industry materials. That was all exempted, and so we've got this odd situation that as Putin continues the war, as the price of oil goes up per barrel every dollar, it's billions of dollars into his pocket. Putin and his cronies, the oligarchs, and the guys who run Ga Gazprom. By the way, one of whom is the former uh, chancellor of Germany, uh, Chancellor Schroeder. Uh, those guys all make a ton of money. So he's making more money now after sanctions with this war going on than he was making before. So unless we're going to cut off the oil and gas sales, you know, th this, this war is not going to end because there's plenty of money for Putin to fund his war machine. Now, look, we need our allies to contribute, to get involved in this. We, we could cut it off ourselves. It would be better if we had the, our allies. Most of our allies are on board. Boris Johnson, the prime minister of the UK, is on board. Uh, President Macron in France is on board. Others are. Unfortunately, the Germans, you know, and th this was a problem. They're the ones who had Nord Stream 2. They're the ones that refused to pay their 2% of their GDP for, for their military for NATO. Now, they're the ones that have, that, that have had this very cozy relationship with Russian oil and gas. It's very hard for the Germans, and they've made some good steps recently. I've been very critical of the Germans over the past couple of years, even as National Security Advisor. They have made some good steps. They, they've promised to start build, rebuilding their defenses. They've promised to, to engage with the, the United States and the European allies on sanctions, but they're still buying the Russian oil and gas. And until the Germans shut off the flow of euros and dollars to Vladimir Putin, he's going to have plenty of money, not only for this war, but for Syria, for Libya, they're now in, in Mali, in, in the Sahel, in, in Northwest Africa. Uh, you know, he's going to continue to have all the resources he needs to, to, to create trouble and mischief around the world. And we've got to cut off and stop those oil and gas sales. These half-measure sanctions no longer work. I understand that people wanted to give a, a ladder for Putin to climb down. But he's showing as this invasion continues and, and intensifies today, he's not taking that off-ramp. So since he didn't take the off-ramp, we've got to close the off-ramp. And, and, and give the Ukrainians a fighting chance. The Ukrainians are fighting and fighting hard. You think Ukraine can win this? I'd go further. And, you know, when we do something like this and where there are cameras, and you know, we've all lived long enough to, to recognize that the, 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 uh, the, there's a legacy to the tape. I, I wager everything that when that tape is played, I'll be right. The Ukrainians are going to win. And what we're going to be doing is saying, how many lives did, they let the, did we let them lose of their families to be able to win that fight for us? And that's, that's, that's the calculation right now. Why do you think it's this that unifies the progressive side, progressives and conservatives? I talked about the differences in people who push back in each party, but there's also a lot of unity, as you all have talked about this. Why do you think it's this one? There have been other places around the world. I think, you know, as we talked earlier, I think that, that it, it is fairly commonly considered that there is very little ambiguity to this conflict. The other thing that's significant is that their skin is not brown and their skin is not black. Uh, the shape of their eyes is not different from ours. And what can be significant and powerful about that is because of the lack of ambiguity of the mission, the mission for democracy, for the, in the fight for the, the freedom to dream. This can be the example that we can apply to so many other places that we've never been able to break that wall of our own um, unfamiliarity or sense that we're distanced in some way from people because they look different from us because there are many other unambiguous battles being fought and people suffering. 
And because if this one is one clearly, and if we accept that part of the reason that might happen, that we might help, that others may help, is because it's easier to recognize people that look like us. Make that a good thing, and make it a good thing only if immediately it parlays into a change in our culture about that, that we've, that we've failed consistently with all the best efforts and will, with great leaderships on so many sides in so many countries, and yet you say, why? And too many times the answer is because they're black, they're brown, they don't feel like us, they don't see like us, and we let them down. Ukraine can be the Trojan horse for so many things, and Ukraine can also be the wall against anything if we let it fail. Last thing on, on these, and I want to point out that we've put up your organization core on the screen uh, if people want to get involved. For people who we get a ton of uh, people to say, what, what can we do? Uh, what can we do? So, so there, there are a ton of organizations out there from the Salvation Army to the Red Cross to Samaritan's Purse, uh, Franklin Graham's organization to, to Sean's organization with CORE that are doing amazing things for the Ukrainian people. Their American spirit is trying to get some military equipment uh, to the Ukrainians. So that there's a lot that can be done. Uh, but I just want to add one thing to, to uh, what Sean was saying. I think on the, on the conservative side and why, why there's a, you know, su su such support for the, the Ukrainian people, it's not just that uh, a big country is bullying and invading and taking away the, the, the liberty and freedom and democracy and sovereignty of a, of a neighboring country. It's that the Ukrainians, unlike many of the other wars that we've been involved in, and, and, and the American people are weary. They're tired of sending their sons and daughters, and, and I had to go to Dover many times with the president or on my own representing the president uh, to, to welcome back our fallen heroes and, and try and comfort their families. The Ukrainians aren't asking for American soldiers. They're not asking for American airmen or, or Marines or sailors to defend themselves. They want to defend themselves. They're defending their own country. And they're asking from us the tools necessary to do that. They're asking for us to, to have that traditional American role of being the arsenal of democracy. So, so if we can you know, support them and provide them with what they need, they'll do the fighting for themselves because they're committed to their own liberty, they're committed to their own freedom. And I think that struck a, a nerve. They're not saying, hey, you need to come defend us from the Russians. They're saying, you need to give us the tools we need so we can defend ourselves from the Russians. And I think. They're uh, across, you know, with, with you know, folks who are normally anti-war on the left and, and folks who are weary on the right of, of the many interventions we've had over the past 20, 30 years, there's a recognition that this is something different. This is something special about these people that have the spirit and the courage to fight for, their own, for themselves and their own freedom, and we need to lend them a helping hand. As, as Franklin Roosevelt said in that famous speech, you know, when your neighbor's house is burning down, you give them the garden hose. You don't, you don't try and sell it to them. But we need to give, give the Ukrainians a garden hose to deal with the fire in their house, and they'll, they'll put the fire out themselves. Uh, President Zelensky's people uh, pass on their best. Uh, he has that same message, still looking uh, for help, and he's dealing with it on the ground with these dignitaries. Um, you do have a day job, and uh, you're in the process of this new series called Gaslit, which we're sitting in the East Room of the Nixon White House, uh, which deals with, uh, you play, John Mitchell, the Attorney General. Um, and we have a clip. The mm. episodes, first seven, launch April 24th. Let's take a look. Julia Roberts had, had worked with uh, a, a filmmaker named Sam Esmail on a project called Home, Home, Homeland, I believe it was, a Homecoming. And um, they had come to this project about Watergate. It started as a podcast called Slow Burn. And what was fascinating about it, I, as a, a kid, I don't even remember why, but I was eating up the Watergate hearings. And just, it was fascinating to me. And so one knew all the public stories. And, and then, um, you know, and I had, you know, from being whatever I was, a teenage, young teenager, um, known who the personalities were, but not much about what was going on behind the scenes of their lives and in the time of Watergate. And so this was fascinating. Um, it was, f you know, but for, you know, the crisis that it meant for the country in so many ways, it, it was hysterical. I mean, it, the, the kind of, the total incompetence of the, 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 the plumbers. The, the, I mean, it, it was not anything that I think that we've at least seen out loud 
with so many extreme characters of extreme flaw pulling the chains on it. And yet also people who, like us, loved their spouse, were concerned about their, in their personal lives. And so it was a really accessible way to take the, 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 you know, young people in particular, which is I think every time any of us do anything, we think kind of, I, you know, what can we offer them uh, that we might have previously failed to offer them? And it's a great way to step into that historical lesson. It, it's, it was incredibly uh, timely, as it turned out. There's a, there are a lot of themes related to what that time meant for, for the, the United States and what is going on today. So uh, Julia and I had had several times where we had tried to or wanted to work together on various things, and it took uh, you know until this one that it all worked out. And so we all went and jumped and did it. How long does it take you to get in that maker? Yeah, I think the first couple of times it's about seven hours in a chair. Wow. <laughs> and then you know, like a pit crew getting you know, their, their steam up, but it, it, it got down to about four hours every morning, and um, that will tax the mind <laughs> for a period of time. That looks great. Um, listen, thank you so much for doing this today. Uh, when does the documentary come, do we know? Yeah, so the, the documentary itself is a pretty you know, fluid thing. We, what we are doing is, Certainly, and we've met, represented this to the, you know, everyone from President Zelensky to the grassroots leaders that we believe in and know in, in Ukraine. If we feel we have a piece of footage that somehow you know, uh, uh, furthers, uh, you know, this is, this is <laughs> there was a moment, I don't know if we're gonna put it in the movie, but this is the biggest sneak peek you get. There was a moment when I was talking to somebody that worked with the president, and I, I said, uh, and, and people will, you know, criticize me as making a pro-Ukraine propaganda film, and I just found myself looking into the camera and saying, I hope so, because that, this is not, we are not, this is not without bias. We, we, we are clear uh, and, and about the position this film's gonna take. Uh, but I think we'd like to tell a very full story, but we'll release things if they're, you know, we stumble on a magic uh, piece of something that we think helps the mission, then we'll, we'll release it. But in the meantime, we, we plot away, right, Aaron? <laughs> <laughs> and what's next for you? Well, let's, uh, well, let's see what happens in, uh, in November. And uh, I'd <laughs> like, like, like to see, the, uh, see Kevin McCarthy as a speaker and Mitch McConnell as the, as the leader. And uh, in the meantime, I'm back in the private sector enjoying time with Lil Marie and the, the family and kids. And, uh, and having a lot of fun with clients and, uh, and, and family and friends, so we'll see. I agree happens. with the second half of what he just said. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Sean Penn, former National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien, I'm Brett Baer, thank you so much.